Uh, good morning. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech, the 10 o'clock block. We're talking tax with Tom Yamachika this morning, as we do on Thursdays at 10. Every couple of weeks, we learn so much. We need to learn tax because it affects us directly, every single one of us. And it affects our state government as well. Um, so today we're going to talk about uh, the, the gross excise tax. And yes, um, you can be affected by it, even if it's a corporate obligation. New twists in the GET with Tom Yamachika. Welcome to the show, Tom. Morning, Jay. Great to be here as usual. Yeah, and we, and we always have happy talk, right? <laughs> well, it, it's scary talk <laughs> sometimes, but uh, we, we do learn stuff. So I think that's a good thing. So we're going to talk about a twist that uh, people should not like uh, in the way the GET is interpreted. But let's a moment about George Freitas. Uh, I don't know if you remember him. He was the director of the tax office back in the 70s, actually from statehood on, I think. And George's one mission in life was to make the gross excise tax plenary and ubiquitous. No exceptions, no, uh, no exceptions, no exemptions, no nothing. And, and that's his gift to us today. There are very few exceptions or exemptions to the gross excise tax. It pervades our commerce and our lives, and it is getting more expensive. So you can say it's a 4% plus um, tax, and uh, it's less than, say, New York, which is 7%, I think, or more. Um, but in fact, it's just as high because it covers so much, uh, including, for example, drugs and food and all kinds of things that the New York tax and other taxes in the country don't, don't cover. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, the GE tax is uh, perversely fair in that it applies to almost everything. So, <laughs> so, so, so it, it doesn't matter what sector of the economy you're in, uh, the tax is going to apply. So like a lot of jurisdictions on the mainland, um, they impose sales taxes and those don't usually affect services. So, you know, being an attorney or, uh, you know, being a CPA there is good because you can earn services income and, and escape tax on it, but here you can't. Yeah. We're unique that way. We're, I think we're unique around the whole country that way. So well, we, do when... have the, we do have the broadest tax bar none. Um, New Mexico comes close. Uh, well, it's, not, it's really not that close. Uh, our, our coverage is far broader than New Mexico's. Yeah. So it's... Mm, yeah, and then, we, and then we added, um, we, we added uh, something for Oahu. Um, you know, I, I can't even remember why we added a special kicker for Oahu. Can you talk about what happened there? Uh, that's the county surcharge, and we uh, did it to build rail. And, uh, rail. Uh, that's a happy thought. Yeah, and, and that was that came in in the, I think the 2006 session, uh, and uh, uh, it was so um, good of an idea that the other counties wanted in too, and uh, uh, most of them bought in except for Maui, and then Maui Maui wants to get in the action as well, because their revenue picture is being squeezed for you know a number of reasons. One of one of which that's is. The, t the, t the transient accommodations tax, which, which uh, previously was shared with the counties, A, has gone through the floor, and B, what little is left has been shut off by Governor Ige in an emergency proclamation. Now, people have to realize that even if there isn't a specific tax increase, there are so many ways that the state government can find, find more money and squeeze the taxpayers. It's, it's endless. And it's a search every single legislative session to squeeze the taxpayer just a little more without, without clearly indicating that the taxpayer is being squeezed. This is very problematic in Hawaii. Yeah, and one more point before we get to the substance of our discussion is where does Hawaii stand on the total tax burden of the taxpayer as opposed to other states? Uh, we're, we're way up there. Um, it, it depends on the measure that's being used. Uh, but uh, we're either number one or in the top five uh, in, in most of the measures I've seen, in most of the studies I've seen. Yeah. And, what, and what's interesting is the legislature, and for that matter, the governors, even though they may talk, talk a good game about expanding the economy, the um, fact is that 
Um, we have not expanded the economy into other sectors, such as innovation and technology, uh, after all these years of talking about it. And if we did that, we'd have a greater tax base and therefore less of a need, you know, and we would have the tax base to cover all state expenses or more state expenses. Um, so what we're doing is we're not increasing the tax base and we're taking more out of each taxpayer. This is not a sustainable program going forward. Do you agree? Oh, yes. Um, when when you impose taxes, you put a break on the economy, you know, uh, you know, the, the, the break that uh, stops cars rather than, you know, you know, break like a tree branch. Uh, but um, and a break on the economy is not what we need. We need the gas. We need more economic activity in more sectors. And for that, we need to be creative and we have to develop the sectors. I mean, one sector that uh, the think tech has been focusing on is, is diversified agriculture. We're still, still limping along. Everybody has a good word about the, the benefits of diversified agriculture for our state. But if you look, you can see that it's not going anywhere, or at least not anywhere fast. And the talk well exceeds the action. Is an example of an area that could be very lucrative for the state because that would be additional economic activity and would help at existing tax rates. It would avoid the need to increase the tax rates or directly or indirectly and squeeze the taxpayer. This is the, the kind of visionary thing the legislature should be doing and talking, not more than talking about actually doing and focusing on over the years to come. We, we're an island state. We can't shrink our industrial sector, our economic sectors. We have to expand them and become in the process more self-reliant. Should I stop now, Tom? <laughs> are, you, are you done with your soapbox today? Yeah, I just had, I had to tell you that, that's all. <laughs> okay. No, <laughs> well, I, talk, I, I totally agree. Let's talk about the gross excise tax because that's, you know, whether people realize it or not, it's regressive. And, it, you know, it has a uh, proportionately greater effect on um, the lower uh, end of the economic spectrum. So that if you're, um, you know, middle class or below, you're paying a proportionately higher amount of money uh, on the gross excise tax than a rich person. Can you explain about regressive and progressive taxes? Sure. A, a regressive tax is one that's imposed regardless of the ability to pay it. So uh, GET and sales taxes in other states are, are pretty much the classic examples of regressive taxes. Uh, the more, uh, you know, the more your state's government depends on regressive taxes, uh, you know, the more you are hitting uh, the poor disproportionately. Because you will find that, as you, as you just mentioned, uh, the, the poor will wind up paying more as a proportion of their income in taxes than the rich. And, you know, as a policy matter, some people, you know, think that's not good. Um, progressive taxes are taxes that are pegged on the ability to pay. Uh, pretty much the only example that we have is the net income tax. So our, our net income tax has tax brackets and and you and you pay more than what you make. Well, two years ago, my wife and I went to, I think it was Oregon, it was Portland. <clears throat> and we went into a Best Buy store there. And uh, I bought something. And I'm looking at the, the price and the total price charged against my credit card. And there was no tax. It was just the price. And I felt, felt liberated. It was very attractive to be able to buy just the price. And I'm saying to myself, gee whiz, you know, it, what it shows you is that we're all used to the gross excise tax, but it is clearly an economic burden on everyone. When you start adding 4.712 and to everything you buy, it really becomes oppressive. And, and you only realize that when you don't have to pay it. <laughs> freedom, freedom at last. Right, <laughs> well, um, well, welcome to Oregon. Oregon doesn't have a sales tax. They do have income tax and it's, and it's, uh, uh, it's up there. 
Yeah, okay, but I don't I don't reside in Oregon, so I don't have to pay income tax there. <laughs> well, good for you. Thank you. So anyway, let's let's get, and, let's and get we'll on talk about it. the gross excise tax in this session, or at least the gross excise tax as it relates to people who are officers of corporations. That for Actually, one reason, you don't even have to be an officer. A signatory, a bank you can, signatory. You can be a payroll clerk. You can be an AP clerk, right? Mm -hmm. um, as long as you have the ability to make payments. And, and and this is you know something that uh, that we all know from payroll tax. If you uh, are running a company and you uh, you pay workers payroll tax, and the IRS has to give them credit for that tax on the return, but you don't actually pay the tax to the government, then then the government gets you know fairly perturbed because of course their money's been stolen. And they can collect that money against any responsible person in the company. And responsible person means uh, anybody who, who has check signing authority. Okay, well, it's easy any... enough to determine that. All you got to do is look at some checks. Well, it's, it's, it's not that easy to determine. And, and, and let me tell you why. Um, as you probably have figured out from the title of this episode, we've got the same thing on our general excise tax. So if uh, you have the power to pay a, a particular state uh, you know, a G GE tax debt and you don't pay it and you pay somebody else willfully, and there's a willfulness element in there, okay, then you, are particular, then you can be on the hook for that general excise tax payment out of your personal assets. They can come take your house. Okay, and, and it's going to get worse. Okay, um, as I'm going to as I'm going to explain. Okay, so it's like I said, it's like payroll tax. Uh, if you're working for a company and you have the ability to decide who gets paid and who doesn't, um, and you willfully prefer uh, a another creditor over the state when you ha when you have a state tax debt owing. Well, this doesn't mean you, that you simply choose to pay another creditor. That's yeah. that's willful right there. That's willful right there. Yeah. Okay. Um, but that's an element that has to be proved, and that's and that's kind of one, uh, you know, thing uh, that uh, is kind of different between theory and practice, or what the law says and, and what the actual practice is. The actual practice is when you have a corporate entity or any kind of entity and it has a tax debt, it's unpaid, goes to collection, and the collection tries to find tries to find anybody who is associated with that account in terms of you know, officers, directors, payroll clerks, anybody who can sign checks. And the current practice is to send some, all, or you know, a few of them, what's called the notice of personal liability. And what that means is, okay, uh, this corporation owes a million dollars um, in general excise tax. Uh, it's now your, uh, it's now your debt, and you have to pay it from your own personal assets. Well, what, you know, what about what about all of the other officers and directors of the company? I don't know. We're, we're coming to you. We take your money first. If you have any money left, you can go. You know, you can go after anybody else in the company you like for contribution. Uh, but we're taking your money first. So, and that's that's what the law of contribution says. Um, when there's a joint and several tax debt, or any kind of debt which is joint and several liability, uh, the creditor can come after anybody. Get well, satisfied. Let me, let me ask this though. This is uh, there's so many wrinkles here. Um, do they? The, the test here is whether you um, um, whether you willfully intentionally um, failed to pay those you paid other creditors. Yeah, that's that's, that's my a, point. The, the the department doesn't even ask that. Yeah, well, just, they, they, they just they just go to whoever is on the officer director list, and who is you know whoever is on uh, the the check signing list, and they go you pay. 
So the corporation could have, I mean, this is really interesting. The corporation could have a million dollars in the bank. It could have usually all it kinds. Usually it doesn't, but theoretically it could have a million dollars in the bank. They don't care. They're going after you anyway. It's a great leverage point, isn't it? Oh, yeah. You know, if the, if the corporation did in fact have a million dollars in the bank, uh, then uh, unless they owe like, you know, 20 million to everybody else, uh, it then becomes a question of, well, can't they write a check to the, to the state? Um, and in some situations they can, since some, some situations they can't. Like for example, if the corporation had declared bankruptcy, uh, mm -hmm. then there are you know ordering rules and and uh, you know different uh, steps according to bankruptcy law to, to figure out you know who is going to get paid. Okay, well to cut to the quick, you can get a letter in the mail whether it's properly you know it's the result of a proper analysis or not. And it'll say, Tom, your corporation owes gross excise tax, um, and we're we're including you. We're we're going to make you liable for that corporate tax. This would not apply. This would not apply to income tax. It would not apply to payroll tax. Just gross excise tax. Am I right? Uh, it would apply to payroll tax, um, but that that is. Uh, you know, kind of a separate separate topic, but other taxes it would not apply to, no. Okay. Okay. So here you get this letter and it says, we have just converted your corporate uh, gross excise tax to personal, a personal obligation of Tom Yamachiko. Okay? Right. So uh, and now, and now you have, you know, you wake up one morning, get that letter, and now you have your options. Yeah, what are the your question, options? And the questions are what the option, what are your options? Right. Okay. Normal taxpayers, when they get a notice of assessment from the state, they can go to court, they can go to the, uh, the Board of Review, uh, they can appeal internally within the department, and they don't have to pay. You know, for your first appeal, you don't have to, you don't have to pay the outstanding balance. Okay. Um, and, and this is so because you have the right to, you, the taxpayer has the right to appeal within 90 days of an assessment, uh, within 30 days of an assessment, 30 days, not 90, 30. Uh, and that, that appeal is, is to is the tax federal. appeal court. Yeah, and you can, you can go the, to tax so appeal court. So if you, you haven't the paid the appeal. tax ordinarily, you have 30 days to go to the tax appeal court and make your case. And the tax appeal court is a special court just for tax appeals. Uh, where does the board of review sit in all of that? Uh, can you file a, an appeal to the the board review the tax board review instead. Yes, yes. So it's it's one of two. The board review is like the people's court of uh, of taxes. It's uh, at least in theory uh, staffed by you know five people like you and me, uh, and then uh, you need three to have a quorum, and then those three people will you know hear and determine your case, uh, subject of the right to go to tax appeal court you know, if, if either party loses and one one party will lose um that party has the right to appeal further to uh to tax appeal court okay so it's a it's a brand new appeal the um, de novo as it were from the board yes. review now don't you stand a good chance of winning at the board review after all their citizen officials uh, just like you and me and uh, they may be sympathetic to taxpayers, perhaps more than the than the uh, tax appeal court. No? Uh, actually, in practice, that that's not the case. Um, in in practice, uh, what you have is you know when you when you have your board of review hearing, you have your uh, tax assessor on one side, and they and they know the law cold. Okay, the 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 person who normally represents the taxpayer. Uh, usually uh, is a CPA who does mostly federal work or a, uh, an attorney who doesn't do ta much tax. Uh, and typically what happens is the assessor walks all over them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, 
putting that aside then. So what's, what's the best choice if you get nailed with one of these letters one morning? Uh, well, to well, find well, well here's, here's the problem. Yeah. The, the, the problem is that uh, a normal taxpayer has the right to appeal within 30 days after an assessment. You get one of these letters and the, and the tax department has been saying, well, that's not an assessment. So you have no right to appeal. The only thing you can do is pay off the tax and sue for a refund. You go, you, you go, to, go to tax appeal court, you sue for a refund. But that you know, presupposes that you have the ability to pay and can pay the entire tax debt of a company, which you know, sometimes it happens. Uh, if you're just a regular payroll clerk, um, that's probably not going to happen. Well, Especially if the, if the GE of... tax liabilities and you know, in seven, you know, seven or eight figures, that's beyond the capability of most people. Let me go back one step, though. So, if 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 the tax office has assessed the corporation, I guess the same rules would apply to uh, what an LLC and all that. If if the um, the tax office is assessed. You, you can, the corporation can um, file an appeal immediately. So if there is a, a basis for appeal, then the, the corporation should certainly make that appeal within that 30 day period, because that avoids, uh, well, tell me how that works. Does that avoid the possibility of, um, if you win, that avoids the possibility well, let me let me tell you the practicalities it. of it. Yeah, the, the, the practicalities of it are most corporations in, in that in that situation are, are are belly up. Okay, they they have no money, so they can't they they can't pay anything. They can't pay lawyers, uh, you know, to go to court and fight this. They're 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 just kind of getting out of dodge or trying to. They they they're you know, uh, they owe. Jillions of other creditors, in addition to the into the tax office, which is probably why they got into that problem in the first place. And there isn't there isn't enough money to go around, and uh, you know the corporation decided, hey, well, let's let's keep the lights on, uh, or let's keep the phone service, so we at least can try to make more money. And and uh, well, you know what's the what's the tax office going to do to us? Well, this is what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So what about going bankrupt? If the corporation goes bankrupt, does that slow this process down and make it less likely the clerk is going to get nailed? Um, it's going to take away the debt of the corporation. But uh, personal liability is a separate independent debt. So the clerk is still on the hook? The clerk's still on the hook. Okay, so what you, you've described a pretty awful picture. The corporation, which, um, you know, is an employer, essentially, of the clerk, and the clerk is just a clerk. He's not necessarily an officer, director, stockholder of the corporation. Um, he gets nailed. He doesn't have the money, almost by definition. The corporation, as you say, is not, doesn't have the money either. So now, what does the clerk do? Well, um, most most clerks in that situation wouldn't be able to do anything. Uh, the department would then, you know, go and clean their bank account, um, take whatever assets they have, put a lien on their house, um, and you know, if if the clerk's saying, "Well, you know, I really wasn't responsible for this. I, you know, this is just what I was ordered to do. I I didn't have a choice in the matter." Well, you know, you got to prove it. Well, oh, suppose he can prove it. Suppose he can show, look, I was just, they gave me a, a instructions to pay these certain <clears throat> other creditors. Um, well, well, you have no place to say that, you see, because if they're, if they're saying um, uh, you don't have appeal rights, unless you, unless you pre pre prepay the tax, you don't have appeal rights. So we're going to go in and drain your bank account, period. Well, in practical, to in practical day to day, I mean, aren't they going to talk to him? Aren't they going to satisfy themselves that this is fair? Or am I dreaming? 
I think you're dreaming. Thank you. Um, okay, so <clears throat> there's a policy point on this. And um, my, my understanding is that the ta tax office has taken a position to interpret the statute in a way that isn't necessarily fair. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, um, I, I think, you know, when somebody, a government agency, turns you from being a, you know, a person with good credit standing to one that owes like a, you know, a, a bajillion dollars, um, I, I think that a person who is affected by that should at least have some due process rights. So you, you have to be able to at least establish to somebody or something that, oh, I was just a payroll clerk. I was just following orders. Somebody else made the decision. Or um, that, hey, the, the corporation never had the money in the first place. We couldn't have, you know, we, we couldn't have paid uh, the audit assessment once it came down. Yeah. So um, is this kind of thing actually happening? I mean, is this a, is this a real problem where in real cases, this, this kind of thing is happening and a, and a clerk does get nailed and I guess he has to, you know, divest himself or, or file bankruptcy and his life is changed? Well, I mean, the, um, uh, this topic is based on a real case. Uh, where I, uh, the tax foundation, which I, you know, which I'm the president of, uh, filed an amicus curiae brief in a in a case that involved this. Uh, the case was settled, so we don't really know how it came out, but uh, it does kind of present the danger. And you know, the state did in fact move to dismiss on the ground that well, you know, uh, tax appeal court, you have no subject matter jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. So um, a more fair result would be to offer the clerk the same remedies that the corporation would have had at the moment of the initial assessment. In other words, he could have, he should be entitled to uh, file a notice of appeal with the board review of the tax appeal court. Um, yeah, the same, the same rights the that, that apply to the, the, the original taxpayer. Okay, and the decision to, to say no to him, that he cannot do that, that he must pay in full before he can file, a, get into court and file a, 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 a claim for refund of what he paid. Um, that's that's a, a, an administrative decision made by um, the tax office rather than by the legislature. Right, the, the, by the tax office and the attorney generals. So how do you fix this? Either by a victory in court or by uh, putting clarifying language in the statute. All right, a, a change in the statute to make it fair. Yeah, and I guess fair. the victory in court one really hangs me up. I, how do you have a victory in court if you can't go to court? Good question. I mean, there are uh, there are extraordinary means to get into court if you if you think the court's not being fair. Uh, but those but those are kind of complicated and. And uh, you know, tough to navigate. Expensive, and they are expensive. Yeah, yeah. For a guy who has no money, this is a this is a real problem. Right. Well, put put this in the context of COVID. You know, I I don't know how things have been going in terms of this kind of um, corporate um, super super assessment on on people. Uh, how how have things been going with these corporations who have failed and thus failed to pay for excise tax? Um, during during COVID, there's a lot of companies that are that have failed, and and a, and a failure may not be one day you close the doors, that's it. A failure may be a slow roll where the the owners and managers tried to keep the thing going, you know, and in the process they had to make choices about what bills they would pay. Uh, how how is how are things going in the community these days? Right, I mean. Uh... People have to make difficult choices, and uh, it just uh, that in 2010 we adopted this law that says, "Well, and if you make this choice, uh, you got to be pre be prepared to pay for it out of your own money." 
So that's that's you know where the title of this episode comes from. You are guaranteeing your corporation's debt. Yeah, there you go. Sobering thought, and and that's uh, uh, what this is all about. You know, if you think this is fair, um, you know, you can go on your merry way. If you don't think it's fair, then maybe talk to your legislator or or uh, uh, you know try to do something about it. Well, in a corporation of an appropriate size, I guess the managers um, would not, just to be fair to their, their employees, their clerks, so to speak, they would sign the checks. They would not um, allow the, the clerk to be exposed this way. And if you were a clerk, um, you know, you, you might say to your manager or your, you know, officer director person in a small company, look, would you mind signing these? I'll prepare them, but you sign them. I'm not going to sign them. It's much too much exposure for me. What about that kind of advice? Oh, maybe. I mean, um, it, it's it's going to be some negotiation between the uh, the managers and the you know people doing the work. But uh, you need to understand, and, and a lot of people don't that uh, that this guarantee of liability is part of the is part of the deal, whether you like it or not. Yeah. What are you going to do if you're the, the clerk and the manager tells you to sign a check? Um, it's hard to say, no, I'm not going to do that because I, I don't believe in you. <laughs> I, I don't believe you're going to cover me. Yeah, you know, yeah. What, it's, what, it's, it's a very, very quick way to be shown the exit. Yeah. Well, the, the, what's interesting, though, is the uh, last question, and we're out of here. Um, what about a manager who doesn't sign checks? What about a, a director or owner, you know, who runs the company but doesn't sign checks? Could we have the odd result uh, where this personal assessment can be made against the clerk, but not the people running the company? Could that happen here? No, of course it could. I mean, the department can assess anybody it wants. Anybody, anybody can grab. Uh, some of the owners may be on the mainland or or somewhere outside the country, and uh, you know, it's tough to acquire jurisdiction over them. So, so you, you take what you can find and you and you and you whack them, and then it's their problem to get, you know, their former bosses uh, to contribute. Well, I suppose they would have a, a claim against their former bosses, wouldn't they? Yeah, they would. Yeah. And and so the question is, is that something you you allow? Um, you know, are you going to let the uh, you know, temporary inconvenience of the clerk uh, uh, go because uh, and and then and then endanger the rest of the state because you can't get your tax revenue. Well, on top of everything, we have to be fair and ethical yep. and moral and decent, and that's really the test here. But thank you for this discussion, Tom. It's an interesting issue. It's a live issue. And uh, I look forward to more discussions along the same lines. Tom Yamachika, President of Tax Foundation of Hawaii. Aloha. Aloha.